Welcome to the Click Podcast. I'm Danny Watson, a mindset and manifestation expert and founder of The Click, a company that helps women overcome their fears and limiting beliefs to create a life and business that they love. Within this podcast, I will help you get clear on what you want, identify the blocks that are holding you back, transform your mindset and raise your vibration so that you can co-create magic with the universe. If you are looking to design a life that truly sets your soul on fire and manifest more success and abundance, then you are in the right place. Hello ladies and welcome to a brand new week and a brand new episode, which I wanted to try something a little bit differently this week. Um, I often get these sort of nuggets and flashes of inspiration that are, I kind of just get them when I'm on the go. And often what I will do is I will perhaps have a Google Docs that I will open up and I will jot down a few words or maybe just in my journal, or I may even just pick up my phone and to make a voice note on whatever it is that's come up for me. And then normally I kind of park that idea and then I use that idea for a piece of content later. So it might be something that I discuss on my YouTube or here on the podcast or something that goes into um, one of my coaching programs. So what I thought I would actually kind of record on the go this week and kind of share whatever sort of downloads I'm getting in the moment and then put them all together for an episode. And this is something that I want to try a little bit more of this year and just to create a different way of creating content, I guess. So this was going to be the first sort of episode where I I create in this way. Um, Maybe I won't do it every week, but um, I thought I'm going to give it a go for this week. Um, And the idea was there would probably be about four or five different snippets of these downloads that I got over the course of the week. Um, There is two. So we're going to cover two different topics today, um, mainly because the second topic I went into on imposter syndrome, when I started to kind of talk about that, it ended up being a much longer dialogue than I initially thought it would be. So we're going to dive into routine and perhaps where morning routine and rituals that you may have may not always be the best thing that you're doing for yourself and why that might be the case. And then we're going to go into imposter syndrome and why I'm actually going to call bullshit on imposter syndrome. Um, And I'll share a little bit more why um, in this episode. So yes, enjoy this new style, ladies. We'll give it a go for this week, see what the feedback is. Um, But yes, enjoy and I will catch you on the next episode. So I've been thinking recently a lot about my own morning routine and the power of having a morning routine for me is still very valid. It's something that's been very challenging for me over the past 12 months with having small children and renovating our home. And there's definitely been times when I've struggled to do anything and I've really kind of made myself feel guilty about that. I've beaten myself up about the fact that I've not been as consistent as what I normally am with my morning routine. But actually on the flip side of that, it's got me to really think about um, and bring more intention about how I really want to be living my days and how I want to choose to start my day. And it got me thinking about how I perhaps have slipped into autopilot or I had previously slipped into autopilot when it came to my morning routine. So I thought, well, maybe my, this is an invite for me, for me to kind of mix things up a bit in terms of what I'm doing in the morning and the routine that I have. And I started to consider that I know so many different successful people and they all have different things that they do as part of their different routine that really, really work for them. So for somebody, it might be that journaling and meditation are the kind of the things that they always go to. For somebody else, it might be EFT. For somebody else, it might be breath work, it might be yoga. And there's so many different tools that we have access to. And I think often the struggle with creating a consistent morning routine is that we're often fed all of this noise about what we should be doing and it can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming. What tends to happen is when we're overwhelmed, the mind kind of shuts off and struggles to make any decision at all, which is why sometimes people will fall off the bandwagon with things like a morning routine. So I was starting to kind of dive into this and I realized that I wanted to start mixing up my routine and try different things depending on what I really needed in that moment because I knew there were so many different things that really have supported me in terms of my mindset, in terms of my self-worth, 
um, tools that I use for law of attraction, for my feminine leadership. And it may be that one day I'm feeling called to use a specific tool. Another day I'm feeling called to use something else. Now, the thing is, this kind of got me down a rabbit hole of about routine in general. The thing with routine is that at the beginning, something can feel very new and exciting, but soon enough, it becomes a habit that we do on autopilot. So what happens is we've ended up taking any thought out of the routine and it just becomes something that you do. So a morning routine, a morning ritual is a very good example of this. And this may mean that you actually become really efficient with your morning routine. You know, it's something that you get done, you tick it off your to-do list and that makes you feel good. That productivity makes you feel d- good. And I'm definitely here for efficiency. There's definitely times within business where being efficient can be very, very helpful. But it made me start to think, like, is this really kind of my core value? Is this my priority as a feminine leader? And I realized that it's definitely not. Presence is. Intentionality is. Finding the joy in the moment is. Noticing how I'm really feeling in a moment. These are the things that I know that I want to lead with. These are my core values. And what I actually know to be true is that these are the things that have actually supported my growth the most. Not being the most efficient person in the room, which is what I used to believe. I used to believe that to be the most successful, to create more wealth, I had to be the most efficient. I had to just get things done. But looking back over my journey, I know that moving into a more mindful life, this has been the thing that's helped me surpass all of my expectations. So having this intention behind my morning routine, it's become really important for me um, as I am then choosing to live life by design rather than default. And every single day is then an opportunity to experience life in a different way, according to what I need in the moment. I'm not just going through the motions. Now, kind of starting to think about this, it also got me questioning, well, how efficient do we really need to be anyway? You know, often this efficiency, productivity, it's often, you know, hailed as the champion of success. But for me, as I said, it's kind of being more present, being more mindful. When I look back, it's the times that I've allowed myself to be more intentional, perhaps even slowing down to be more present These are the things that have really made the difference. Now, taking off my morning routine, it has in the past when I've been doing this, you know, it has, there's been times in my life where that has felt really good to be like, yes, I've been productive today. I can take this off. But what was a really big wake up call for me was that I was actually deriving more joy from the fact that I could say, I got up early and I got this done rather than the routine itself. So I was actually placing more value on my efficiency and productivity than my intentionality, presence, and how I was actually feeling productivity aside. So this was very much revelatory of my belief system. Because if I was placing more value on efficiency, what I was really saying is that I believe efficiency and productivity are the most important things. And I knew that I did not want this to be true. Because... Yes, while I know that just getting things done and not overthinking things and working at pace and avoiding distractions, you know, that efficiency mindset, and there's some areas where I'm definitely an advocate for that, but just getting things done without any thought behind it at all, you know, get things done quickly for what? Well, it's often, you know, the thought that goes with that is, well, I want to get to where I want to be quicker. But guess what? This is what I know to be true. When you get there, you will realize that it won't be your final destination because we're always seeking to evolve. And then what happens is that life just becomes this pursuit of some elusive end goal and we never actually get there because there's always something more. So what I invite you to do is to notice where the things that you're doing that are supposed to be helping you become more mindful and present are now just you living life by default. And what does this therefore then say about your belief system? Because remember, we are a product of what we subconsciously believe. So if we are choosing productivity and efficiency over intentionality and presence, it's because there's a part of us that believes that this is required of us in order to succeed, in order to get to where we want to be. And so it's really about then challenging what you know to be true about efficiency, allowing yourself to slow down 
and trusting that in doing so, it's actually going to take you much, much further. A really, really interesting conversation came up this week in my She Leads coaching program. So my She Leads program, it's a program about feminine leadership. And within that group are um, women who are either business owners, they are corporate career women um, who are looking to reach their next level of success, but embracing their feminine energy. So we have a lot of interesting conversations happening within that space. And I love to share with the ladies in that group some of the things that come up for me. And I think one of the things that was a topic of conversation for this week, I think is really relevant, perhaps for a lot of people. So I wanted to share a little bit um, in this little snippet. So the conversation was around imposter syndrome. Um, It's something that comes up in the feminine leadership space a lot because I think it affects women more so than men. Or at least it does from an outsider's perspective. And actually, this is a whole different conversation. And something we also explored was that um, this idea that, you know, women typically struggle with imposter syndrome whilst men tend to back themselves. And I think maybe they do from an external point of view. You know, they will kind of walk into a room and they will own that confidence. They will ask for the pay rise, um, whereas women tend to downplay their achievements. But it's not to say that men don't struggle with imposter syndrome. It perhaps manifests itself in a different way. But anyway, I digress, um, because what we were really talking about is imposter syndrome that women come up against. And I have definitely been through many times in my professional life where I've kind of felt like, that question's popped up, like, can I actually do this? Am I really good enough? And it's something that actually came up relatively recently. My company is, um, we are doing a lot more now within the corporate space. It's something kind of we've always done, but never really, we've never really done it at scale. So just to kind of give you a bit of background to this, whenever I've sort of sold to corporate, it's normally been, um, somebody has approached me and have said, say, for example, that they want to fund one of their employees to go through one of my programs. Um, so there's not really been much of a pitch there because I've been approached by the company. Or we have had programs that have been facilitated within a corporate space, but it's been on a very small scale. And so there's not really a huge kind of process to go through in order to get that um, that program signed off. Now, Contrast that with some of the things I've been doing recently, where it's been much, much bigger pitches, where it's we're looking at sort of potentially rolling out programs within companies where the the kind of level, the process that we have to go through in order to make this happen is a lot more intense. It essentially means connecting with people that are much, much higher up within the company, um, even perhaps at board level. Um, And I had a uh, a situation that happened recently where I was preparing a pitch. Now, this is something that was going to be presented to the board. You know, this is a major decision that this company has to make. And the board is predominantly middle class, middle aged or older white males. And I think this is very much typical still of C-suite within business, where there is very much a disparity between how many women and how many men are getting to C-suite positions. Again, another topic, I digress, but I want to get to my point here (laughs) because this does have a point. I started to really feel that pang of imposter syndrome kick in. Now, I've done a lot of work on imposter syndrome, and I know that whenever it's something new, whenever it's something outside of your comfort zone, there's always going to be that negative self-talk that kicks in because it's it's just something different and it's how we're hardwired as humans to anticipate you know the worst case scenarios you know that negative brain bias wants us to think about the worst thing that could happen or the negative things as a protection mechanism so i know that it's unrealistic for me to start a new project and to not have some degree of negative self talk but i thought you know what i want to explore this because my mind was saying you know, you're not qualified enough for this. You'd have no idea what you're doing. You've never worked with large companies like this before, you know, not at this level. Is your program good enough? Are you good enough? And I started to think, you know, where is this coming from? So I got a little bit deeper and I had a bit of a breakthrough. And I think I wanted to share this because maybe this is something you've experienced as well when it comes to your own imposter syndrome. My imposter syndrome wasn't actually 
attached to my own limiting beliefs about myself. Because I know I've done enough work on myself and I, you know, I've been in this industry for a while now. I know that I know enough. I know that I'm good enough. I know that my programs are good enough. I know what I've got. I've got what it takes to take my business to that next level. I really back myself. But then I was thinking, well, why, why then do I feel this way? And what I realized was that actually what I was feeling, I was actually emulating what I believe others will think of me. So my perception of myself was basically being mirrored what I believed this board would think of me. Okay, so I was essentially seeing myself through their eyes and not actually my own. If I was to kind of really just take a step back and disconnect from anybody else's opinion, I was like, no, I can absolutely do this. So I felt like this imposter syndrome, it was really being influenced by the, the perception of others. And this sort of got me thinking, you know, when we experience what we feel is imposter syndrome, are we actually, is that identity that we are seeing of ourselves? Is it really a reflection of what we truly believe to be true about ourselves? Or have we actually adopted somebody else's perception and our subconscious mind wants to pass it off as our own? So almost convincing ourselves, like, I feel this way about myself. I don't feel like I'm good enough. I don't feel like I'm capable enough. And actually that is not true. We know deep down that we are capable of big, big things, but our thought pattern is being influenced by what we are assuming other people are thinking about us. And again, this is an assumption because ultimately a lot of what we believe other people to think of us, it is not based upon any real concrete fact. Sometimes people may throw away offhanded comments, um, you know, that kind of throw you off guard. You know, they may say something that kind of knocks your confidence, but nine times out of 10, a lot of the time, the assumptions that we're, we're making about what other people are thinking about us are things that we've just created within our own head. Now, this then got me thinking about, you know, if we are adopting the thoughts and opinions of others and we are kind of making these assumptions about what other people think about us and then that's then impacting our own belief system. If this is the case, what that really means is that we believe the opinions of others to be more important than our own. You know, we're almost holding up their opinions to be more credible. You know, there is a part of us within that is saying the voice or opinion of another carries more weight than my own. So it's not, I don't believe that I'm good enough. What we're actually saying here when we feel that sort of imposter syndrome kick in is that I don't believe other people will perceive me as good enough. My fear isn't, can I actually do this? I know that I can. My fear is, will the rest of the world undermine my capabilities. And that was a real sort of wake up call for me because I realized that even though I've got incredible self-belief in my abilities now, very much different to when I started in this process, I still feel like there is work to be done when it comes to my beliefs of how others will perceive me. And I started to kind of really dig into this and I realized that there was a lot of instances from my kind of really going back from even childhood, um, but definitely in my adult life where my abilities have been undermined, my abilities were underestimated, something that always comes up for me. And it must have been important because I remember it and it's from when I was 16. So, you know, we're going back a little bit here um, where I had, it was parents evening, was at school and I'd chosen to take French for GCSE. And I was typically not a very active participant in my French lessons. So I was quite quiet. Um, I felt like I was quite shy to sort of speak up and, um, you know, practice my French in class. So I just kind of, I don't know, I just sat there quietly observing. And I remember during GCSE, the, the parents' evening rather, my teacher saying, oh, well, you know, she'll probably be lucky if she gets a C. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, hmm, that's interesting because I actually thought that French was one of my strongest subjects. And I was sort of typically like an A student, like an A and A star student. Like I was very like a conscientious student at school. I loved learning and loved studying. So when they said that, I was like, hmm, that's really interesting because 
I don't believe that to be true. <laughs> um, and so I think I've got sort of instances where my abilities were undermined. Um, I was perhaps underestimated. FYI, I ended up getting an A star <laughs> in French. And my score was actually, I think it was like in the top five within the country. So you know what, I proved that French teacher wrong. But it was interesting to see how my abilities were underestimated when deep down, I knew my own capabilities. I've had so many in instances that, of this. Another one that springs to mind. So as many of you will know, so I started out my career path in law. And when I was at um, university, my final year of university, we were basically you apply to all of these different law schools for a training contract and they eventually sponsor you to go to law school. Um, so I ended up getting sponsored by this US firm who sort of pay for your law school and then, you know, you, you start working with them. But to get that place, honestly, I had to go through so many rejections. It was really interesting because the, the US law firms are always really sought after because they, they pay the most. Um, and yeah, it was interesting that I ended up getting a contract with a US firm, but I actually got so many rejections. Like, and I think if anything's taught me to deal with rejection, actually, <laughs> was that sort of moment in my life. Um, I, I honestly want to say like 50, 75 rejections from law firms. Um, and I had a very lot of interviews and kind of a very grueling interview process. And I remember really, really clearly, it was a a uh, firm that I had to, I had to do this presentation. I think it was on like something really boring, like data protection laws or something. I don't know. It was a boring subject that I had to do this presentation on. And then we had this kind of like grueling interview afterwards, which I thought I absolutely nailed. Um, and, you know, I kind of felt really, really confident in myself and my abilities. And I thought, you know what, that went really well. And then at the end of the interview, one of the ladies that was interviewing turned around and said to me, have you ever considered a, you know, a career in something else? And I said, well, no, I've just spent a lot of time and energy studying law. <laughs> no, I've not. Why do you ask? And she turned around and said, I don't know. I just don't see you as a lawyer. I see you maybe as... I don't know, somebody in PR or marketing or, you know, something a bit fluffier. And honestly, I literally could have died. <laughs> I look think back to that now and I, I laugh. But I'm like, what, what a wild thing to say. And this was just another instance of somebody really undermining me. And I think maybe it's because, you know, I'm quite like... I'm blonde and I'm quite bubbly and I'm like outgoing and maybe I give this impression of a ditzy blonde, even though I'm very much far from it. I've got a lot of common sense. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think there's um, a lot of the time and, and that obviously knocked my confidence. It started to make me question, oh my God, like, am I on this right, the right path here? Turns out she was probably right. <laughs> there was probably some merit in what she said. I definitely wasn't suited to a career in law. But at the time, I kind of saw that as you know, a reflection of my abilities and my capabilities and putting somebody else's opinion of me on a pedestal, perhaps because of, you know, she was somebody that was very senior in a law firm. And so kind of putting their opinion above me, above my own opinion, above me. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that often imposter syndrome, when we kind of dig into it and explore it a little bit more, it is nothing to do with the fact that we don't back ourselves. Maybe we do have some limiting beliefs, but I think deep down, a lot of us know how capable we are, how wildly capable we are. And then, you know, this often then gets diminished by what we're assuming other people are perceiving us to be. So I have a couple of questions for you here to kind of help you explore this. The first is, who do I feel like I need to be to be taken seriously? And I think what this question does, it gets you to see where your own identity perhaps currently differs to the version that you feel like you need to be in order for the world to take you seriously, in order for the world to accept you. And this really runs deep because ultimately what many of us want is we want acceptance because that equals 
equates to love. And so if we feel like we're not going to be fully accepted by the world, by other people, we often then don't show up at all. So I see this play out where women keep themselves playing small or they, you know, they hold themselves back or they procrastinate on their dreams, not because they don't feel like they're really capable, not because they don't feel like they can make it, because, but because they're worried of the perception of others. So that's the first question. Who do I feel like I need to be to be taken seriously? And who do I feel like I need to be for others to have full faith in me? A similar kind of question, but sometimes gives you a bit of different perspective and a a different avenue for exploration. And these questions, it will help you kind of start unpacking some of this. Now, something I feel like that's really kind of helped me as well is the perception of me that others may have. If it's a false one, start to see that as their weakness, not as mine. So what I mean by that is that I can really stand firm in who I am and know what I am capable of. And the fact that somebody else is going to unmind me will more fool them. Um, For me, I use it to kind of light a fire in my belly, not because we don't want to get into that proving mentality, right? We don't want to get into this. I need to do this to prove to other people what I'm capable of. I'm doing it more from a place of I know what I'm able to do and able to create and who I came here to be, I can stand firm in that. And, you know, if a byproduct of that is that I'm going to show you what I'm capable of, then so be it. But I am not doing it for you. I am doing this for me. So making sure you're kind of always leading with your desires first, because again, we don't want to get into this proving mentality because ultimately it's, it can be a never ending cycle because there's always going to be somebody that underestimates us, undermines us. And we have zero control about how other people perceive us. We could aim to emulate this perfect version of success or who we feel like we need to be to be successful and successful and credible and valued and respected, yet we could still be undermined. So it's really important that we just lead with our authenticity and, you know, be who we're meant to be free from the opinion of others. I think this just becomes so much easier to do when we know who we truly are, when we know who we want to be in this world and we start making that a non-negotiable. It's like, I am not going to compromise my identity, my values to be a certain way so that I can, you know, feel like I'm taken more seriously by other people. This is who I choose to be and I have full faith and trust that this is enough. And it is more than enough to help me reach my own personal goals. And if you underestimate me, (laughs) you know, that is on you. Okay. Um, So yeah, I hope some of this resonated with you today, ladies. I, yeah, as I said, I I think this is a really, really fascinating topic. And I'm sure um, lots of you will perhaps be nodding your head in agreement here. But yes, have a wonderful rest of the week, ladies. And I will catch you on the next episode. Bye, ladies. Wanting to build your own successful online coaching business, make sure to check out Freedom, Abundance and Impact, our free 10-day business and mindset course for coaches and aspiring coaches. To access, simply head to wearetheclick.com and click free course in the menu.